Welcome everybody to the um, March Be Learning Lunch event. Um, it's B Corp Month and it's Women's History Month. Hope you're all up to some th fun things. I just wanted to start with a few reminders before um, I get started on some introductions and overview for today. So we will be recording this session and we'll be posting it to our YouTube channel within one week of the event. And if possible, or it'd be great if everyone could mute their mics when not speaking um, and ask questions in our chat. And if you can, we'd love to see your faces. So turn on those videos if you're comfortable. Um, and then if you all, also just for more connection, it'd be great uh, if you want to rename yourself in Zoom so we can see your full name, your pronouns, um, and maybe your organization. And feel free to say hi in the chat too. Um, and if you have any questions, put them in the chat or uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. You can unmute and ask them out loud too. Um, so just a little background, uh, uh, Be Local PDX um, made, is hosting this event, made possible by these our wonderful panelists today. Be Local PDX is a community in the greater Portland area that helps business people act on their purpose to achieve socioeconomic and environmental impact through meaningful relationships. And um, we're mostly a group for B Corps. And so for some of you, if you aren't a B Corp, certified B Corporations are for-profit companies that use the power of business to build a more inclusive and sustainable economy. So a little bit about today, um, we'll kind of start with some of these welcomes, um, a little bit of introductions. Then we'll have some time for community announcements. So if you have any things upcoming um, that we should know about, start thinking about what those can be. Then we have an amazing panel um, listed here and I'll, I probably won't go into introductions. I think we'll start with that in the panel. So we have this listed here. Also, we will be sharing the slide deck too um, in the recap if you want to find out the details. Um, I'm Rose Lavelle. I'm the learning chair on the Be Local PDX board. I also work for a Portland uh, B Corp called Scout Books. And we usually start with just um, kind of identifying any of the board members on our call. Just if you have any questions or want to connect with us, you know who to ask. So Craig, would you like to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Craig Hill. I know most of you on the call, but if I don't know you, I look forward to getting to know you better. I use he, him pronouns, and I work for B Corp Beneficial State Bank, uh, and I'll also be moderating the panel today. Um, I'll call next on. Let's have uh, Tia take it away. You want to go next? Sure, Craig. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tia Sherry. My pronouns are she, her. I am a board member for B Local PDX, and my day job is I am director of development for the Urban League of Portland. Nice to see everyone. How about you, Georgia? Lee, you want to go next? We're, uh, oh, sorry. we're actually just going to be introducing board members right now, just so people in the community, if they have any questions, um, but we will be introducing our panelists uh, in just in a few minutes. So. Cassandra, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I'll mute. No. Hi, I'm Cassandra Furlong. I'm the ABC chair for the Be Local PDX board. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I work for Northwest Permanente, which is the third largest B Corp in the state of Oregon. Mike, you want to jump in here? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Mercer here, Be Local PDX board. I'm sitting here in the hur unheated Hurricane Creek Grange in Joseph, so it's a little chilly, but uh, I have Wi-Fi, so that's good. And uh, my, my business is M Mercer Consulting. And looks like we have David on the call, too. Hey, everybody. I'm David. Uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, also a board member. I work at Fully in Portland and super excited to hear the panel today. And I think that's all the board members, but if not, feel free to speak up. Um, all the board members here today, we do have more. <laughs> um, and before we move on to announcements, I just wanted to mention, here's our overview today, but um, depending on interest um, and time, we will definitely have the opportunity to connect in small group breakouts at the end of the event. So if you wanna stick around to kind of connect more one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, um, please stay to the end. All right, so, 
next, oops. Oh, and here are our panelists. I'll let them introduce themselves in just a little bit here. And now it's time for community announcements. So um, I have a few from the board, but if you have anything going on, are you hiring? Do you have upcoming events? Are there other opportunities for the community that we should know? You can feel free to either paste those in the chat or you can unmute now and give a quick 30 seconds or less uh, announcement. I'll give it a few seconds to leave time. I could throw it in there. Beneficial State is currently looking for someone to work out with our marketing team. Um, we are an awesome place to work and I definitely encourage you to reach out to me directly or check a recent LinkedIn post from Beneficial State uh, for the hiring for the specifics on that team, but you'd be uh, joining a team that's very B Corp minded. And if you know anybody who wants to join and work for a B Corp, we'd love to have you and have them apply. I'd love to make an announcement if I can, even though we're not in Portland. Um, it's Brent Kessel at Abacus. I'm one of the panelists, but uh, we have about, I think it's eight positions right now that we're hiring for. Um, and uh, we're a national firm that serves people nationally. So if you're interested, uh, abacuswealth.com slash careers is where the job descriptions are listed. Thanks. I have a few board announcements um, and I'm sharing my screen now, but I will paste them in the chat in just a few minutes. So um, we, uh, every year we have an annual uh, BLD conference for the Pacific Northwest. It's B Corp Leadership Development. And we just put out a call for volunteers and an application for being part of the planning committee. So if you want to join in and volunteer some of your time between now and our fall event, um, I'll be putting that in the chat. So we'd appreciate um, all everybody who's interested. And um, I will also, if you have ideas for a learning lunch in the future, we do these monthly. Um, we have a request for proposals form. You can, I'll put that in the chat or you, or you can just email me directly. Um, and also next month's event, though we don't have it on Eventbrite and ready to register yet, um, that will be up in the next few days. Next month's event is going to be re-energizing ABC groups. So our ABC groups, um, also called Always Be Collaborating, um, they are where groups of in, uh, employees from certified and pending B Corps in our region can join and work with other people in similar roles, such as HR, marketing, um, impact reporting. So I will, um, you can stay tuned for our newsletter for registration, or you can follow the local PDX on Eventbrite and be notified of any events that we're hosting. And like I said, I'll put that in the chat in just a few minutes. So are there any other community announcements? All right, well, if you think of any, feel free at any time, to put those in the chat. Oops. All right. So that is um, from my part for here introducing. So I'm going to pass it over to our panel moderator, uh, Craig Hill. All right, everybody. Wow, I got the Brady Bunch back. There we go. Um, welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Um, and if you're not in this room today, I'm excited that you're watching this later on YouTube. Uh, I know everyone on this panel is definitely presenting a lot of uh, information that I hope will be useful to you. And if it's not news to you, that at least it's hopefully a refresher uh, and an opportunity to bring some intentionality to your uh, your practices as a company. It's one of these areas, a lot of folks think about B Corp and they think about uh, different values that B Corp, environmental, uh, employee retention, uh, a lot of other benefits, uh, procurement policies, but they're not necessarily thinking of procurement in terms of your financial partners. Uh, and this doesn't just relate to companies, but to individuals as well. Um, there's a lot of incumbency when it comes to financial decisions, a lot of like what your parents did. Uh, there's a lot of different histories and backgrounds of how people have made decisions and they don't necessarily historically, especially with money, become centered around values. Um, certainly their definition of value was limited to financial value for a long time. Uh, and I'm really excited that this panel that we have here today is going to be able to speak to the fact that you don't have to just make decisions strictly 
uh, on the way that you made them 10, 20 years ago, if you made them at all. Um, there's opportunities and lenses to divest from practices that don't you know, comport with your values and invest in partnerships and relationships with people and companies that do comport with our changing values and what expectations are of financial services. Uh, so with that, I want to give a chance for everyone on our panel to introduce themselves. And I'm just going to go and Rose, I don't know if they're if they have slides or in a specific order, if I could just kind of go down the list and let people introduce themselves. So um, we'll just start off first on the list. Nathan, you want to take it away and start us off? Sure, thanks. Uh, should I follow your outline that you emailed to us? That'd be great. Yeah, so just in general, uh, first thing is if you can introduce yourself and your company, how long you've been a B Corp and something unique or different about your background that kind of drives your uh, dedication and commitment to the movement. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Nathan Irons, my pronouns he and him. I'm with Bluestone Life. We're a national life insurance organization headquartered in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, we've been a B Corp since our incorporation in 2015. A uh, number of things drive my dedication to the B Corp movement. I think the catalyst, it's safe to say, was when my daughter was born, and then that brought everything else together. It made it very real to me. Uh, instead of the intellectual understanding and the things that were interesting, uh, it became very real. So that's what the driver is for me day in and day out. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Georgia, same question. Yes. So my name is Georgia Lee Hussey. My uh, pronouns are she, her, and I'm the CEO and founder of Modernist Financial. We are a wealth management and financial planning firm here in lovely downtown Portland, Oregon. And we, um, we help people figure out how they want to structure their wealth around their progressive values. Um, those things, things seem like they can be in conflict, but we believe actually there's a lot of opportunities um, to make more conscious decisions about how we structure, how we engage in the financial world. And um, I, the reason I became, so I founded the company in 2015, we became a B Corp in 2017. And um, I, before I came into finance, I was a sculptor and a writer. And I did a lot of like odd performance art about uh, gender and labor and welder and uh, glass blower, et cetera. And um, I never thought I'd go into business. So if I was going to go into business, I was certainly going to do so with values in mind. Um, so a lot of our work now is about understanding how dominant culture money stories influence who we think we can be in our financial lives. Thanks. You'll see there's a reason we picked the panel we did here, gang. They all have some amazing stories to tell. Uh, Brent, would you like to introduce yourself and Abacus? Sure thing. Thanks, Craig. Uh, nice to see you, Georgia. I've heard great things about you for a long time. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brent Kessel. He, him pronouns. Uh, I'm down in Santa Monica, California, um, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Abacus Wealth Partners. Uh, we're a national uh, fee-only impact wealth management firm, and um, we've been a B Corp since 2007. We were in the kind of founding cohort of uh, of B Corps way back when we have a our first office actually anywhere was in Philadelphia, which is where B Labs uh, started. Um, <clears throat> and so one of our advisors and partners knew knew those folks well. Um, so we were fortunate um, to get in back then when there was still a lot of question. I think about was it going to be B Labs or conscious capitalism or other kinds of good housekeeping seals that would uh, that would show the authenticity of of this movement. Um, I'd say the, the interesting thing about my background um, might be that I was born and lived my first 10 years in apartheid South Africa. Um, and obviously I'm white um, and male and straight and kind of every other definition of privilege uh, you might ascribe. Um, and, but I grew up in a very progressive family. I had a mom who would drive into the townships after dusk against the law to distribute um, uh, uh, healthcare supplies and th her brother owned a pharmacy. And so she would get medicines and other healthcare supplies and take them in there for which she could have easily been arrested. Um, so I only tell that story because it's indicative of the kind of values I grew up around. And so, you know, the uh, obscene systemic racism of that country and that time was made very evident to even eight, nine, 10 year old me. Um, 
And then I got to America, which I assumed and thought would be the promised land, but I grew up in public schools in LA and uh, you know, we've gone to Skid Row every year to help homeless folks, the vast majority of whom are people of color. Um, so I've just seen, you know, this, the racial wealth divide um, up close and spent the last year working on a white paper uh, along with a, a black female CFP co-author about the next 50 years of the racial wealth gap and essentially what we in the financial services industry must do to help address it. Um, it's not only an employer and policy issue, it's very related to the kinds of advice that black and brown folks are getting and more importantly are not getting. So that's me. Thanks so much, Brian. And then last but certainly not least, my colleague at Beneficial State Bank, Emmanuel Bergen. Hey everyone, good afternoon. My name is Manny Baragan. I am a client and treasury manager alongside with Craig here at Certified B Beneficial State Bank. Uh, we've been a B since 2012 and founded in 2007. Now, the unique thing about us is that we're the only bank in the United States that's owned and governed by a nonprofit foundation of the same name, Beneficial State Foundation. Usually banks own the foundation, and this case is the other way around, and it's for a purpose, which I'll talk about um, later. Um, something that intrigued me a lot about certified B corporations and just being around here in this in this community is um, I was born and raised in Mexico in a native place with uh, 20,000 people and coming to coming to LA where there's millions um, two things came to mind um, one is preserving and maintaining of the land the environment um, there's a lot of nature over there and seeing that everything is just being built up and a lot of the environment um, uh, the trees and everything are being cut off here uh, for more land kind of like gets me into that uh, thought of how can we do this in a better way uh, that's not costing so much um, the environment. Um, the, the other thing was the people. Um, the, I came in as, a, as an immigrant and I recently became a naturalized citizen uh, not too long ago. Um, and just the fact that there's a lot of opportunity and, and and equity for, for many, but it's unreachable for a lot because they just don't know who to go to or what community to become involved with, um, kind of drove me to, to find this community and find um, uh, kind of like a little second home here where I can at least garner some of your expertise to then go ahead and, and push forward the knowledge and, and the contacts. Thank you all so much. And it's a great background and framework for these conversations that we're having that uh, we all don't come from a relatively traditional background when you think of our respective industries. Uh, and I think that that is illustrative of kind of the next question that I wanted to tip off. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to seed the conversation with any one person <clears throat> for any of these questions on the panel, but more off for the opportunity for anyone who has what they want to value add on. <clears throat> but in general, if it, it'd be helpful, if you can kind of explain a little bit of your industry background how those institutions historically have made money um, and how that could be very contramission to a lot of folks who ascribe to the B Corp values writ large. Uh, there's a lot of different contramission, the racial wealth gap uh, pieces that Brent had mentioned. I think there's just a great opportunity for us to explore traditionally how financial systems have worked uh, so that we can kind of mine and explore what to look for when things are, are the opposite or inverting that kind of expectation. So anybody who'd like to go first in particular, because I'm not afraid to call names. <laughs> All right, Georgia, you're first up. Let's have it. You get to go first. <laughs> All right. Um, so how the industry tends to operate. Um, so certified financial planners, which is a designation that I hold and I believe um, anybody who's giving advice to a uh, to an individual should hold that designation because it's the the baseline of knowledge one needs to understand. It's kind of like the CPA a bit. It's got a very long, annoying test that you have to take. You have to study for a long time, um, but it it shows that you understand the broad um, array of information that impacts an individual. Um, the issue is is that's really really new. Actually, it's like seventies. Is that right, Brent? 80s early, um, and uh, picking up steam over the past uh, decade or so. But before that, it was primarily product, right? People sold you stocks, 
Um, they were very inefficient structures. You had to buy individual stocks because mutual funds also have a similar um, genesis period. Um, so it was pretty inefficient. Very few people had access to um, financial products. And um, it was selling a product instead of a service. And so I think that's the first, the first problem. And that's, there's a lot of legacy issues in the financial, in the wealth management investment industry around um, instead of providing solutions and insight and structures and paths forward for people, the industry at large sells you stuff that they charge too much money for. Um, so I think that's the, the, the history there. Um, the ways that it drives the racial wealth gap are, uh, vast and interconnected. Um, I would say that the way I think about the industry is that our job is to help people, our clients understand what their core values are, what is important to them, especially politically and how that drives the decisions they make on the daily. And then helping them understand the structures that they're operating within. So whether that's tax planning and understanding, you know, if you believe the dominant narrative that you need to have the lowest possible tax payment, that is actually exacerbating racial wealth inequality. Um, the, uh, so there's dominant narratives there or estate planning, I should have, give all of my money to my children and not having a countervailing narrative um, is part of the problem. So you gotta understand your values, then you gotta understand the structure and that there actually is another choice when the dominant culture doesn't necessarily um, point to or celebrate alternative ways of managing one's money. And then there's that third level of understanding, which is, okay, here's my values, here's the structures, now what am I gonna do about it? What is important to me um, specifically? And so that is the, um, in all the range of insurance and estate planning and charitable giving and investments and financial planning and tax planning and cash flow, um, how we can make that alignment, I think, is really the opportunity. But it's a lot about understanding and literacy and unpacking the way the structures operate. Um, so I, that's why I love Beneficial and Bluestone, because they're helping us understand how your industry operates, which helps the individual uh, purchaser of products and or um, human uh, navigate the world. Um, and then I would say the racial wealth gap, oh gosh, I mean, it, it, I always, <laughs> I think of white finance as sort of the belly of the beast. It's about as bad as it can get in my mind as like a very progressive queer woman. Um, and that's why it's so fun because there's so much opportunity <laughs> to be able to do better. Um, and so things like that we help our clients do is we often talk about things like real estate. There's a great deal of, there's a real estate deeply problematic. So we are encouraging our clients to think about when you buy or sell real estate, what if you gave 3% for reparations to organizations that are helping build uh, access to intergenerational wealth for uh, communities of color? Um, as a firm, we give away 3% of our revenues to organizations that are impacting racial wealth inequality. And clients can do the same thing. You know, there you can do some form of tithing. Those structures are really helpful for humans to say, I commit to a certain percentage, that gives me permission to, to move into that space. And then there's a certain internal satisfaction that's uh, that is uh, created by 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 uh, connecting heart with structure. Awesome. And exploring kind of the, the next couple of questions of things as well, thinking about how you might do things differently in general. Uh, was there anybody else on the panel who'd like to kind of hop in directly after that? I think it dovetails in nicely with uh, with all three of the rest of you on, on these kind of general questions. Yeah, I can go. I can go. So we all know the banking industry to be a very fossilized industry back way when, and usually a lot of people do not know what's happening once you deposit those monies into that your bank account, whether it's a checking savings, um, whatever it is. Um, that, that's why for Beneficial State Bank and the Beneficial State Foundation and brand, it's very important to be transparent and just focus on clients understanding what we're doing with those monies. Um, and, and that's usually how they rate us as to uh, given that relationship experience, that clarity of what we're doing 
um, with your deposits, um, which is why Beneficial State Bank became part of the Global Alliance for Banking and Values, a uh, participant of the Social Just Label, a certified B corporation. And then, of course, our bylaws mandate that um, the for-profit side of the bank operates in which conjunction the, uh, of the Beneficial State Foundation. So basically, all of our all of our proceeds go up to the foundation and then that disperses back into the community and the source of help, grants, um, CRA, um, whatever the bank uh, think is mission impactful. Um, I'll, focus, I'll focus on the uh, contribution, side, uh, contribution side of it, on the environmental degradation and how we make money. Um, so in, in simple terms, banks make money by, you can say a couple of things. Um, one is servicing clients, um, kind of like credit and what I do, uh, treasury management, um, whatever your business needs to operate in terms of, uh, of just keeping that operation side uh, as smooth as possible. And then most importantly, uh, using those deposits uh, deposited by our clients and then using that to lend out for loans and then in turn uh, generate revenue by the interest earned by those loans. Um, those, that's how that's how banks tend to make money, um, and if you think about it, a lot of people just go based on the big banks, focusing just on how many branches are in every corner, or or just going to their website and the first thing they do is just click on products or rate sheet, but the, they don't really dig any much deeper into what the bank is doing with those monies once you deposit into the accounts. Um, so something very important is. You may be subconsciously uh, being contribution to yourself uh, if if one of if your monies ends up in a loan that's very uh, you can say environmentally degrading, um, in in the sense that if you put your monies into a big bank, you just do not know where that money is going to end or into what type of loan it's going to end. Um, this is why we exist on the sense that we have our no harm banking model that we say whatever money you have with us we can ensure that none of those monies are going to go into anything that's contribution to the beneficial state brand. And that's lending to private prisons, natural gas, coal, uh, predatory lenders. We ensure that none of those monies are going to end up in a loan like that, even if it's profitable to the bank. We'll just uh, say no because it is in our, in our policies to uh, reject um, deals like that. Um, so that's that's one of that's one of the ways that uh, you may be uh, doing something contribution to you without knowing by banking with a bank that you don't fully understand what they're doing with their money. Um, that's that's one of the ways. Um, uh, the uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, actually, that I'll finish. Yeah, that's that's great, man. I think it's it's just indicative of again thinking around the framework within banking of taking deposits and making loans. Right, like if that's all, if that's the only characteristic to make a decision upon, um, it leaves the door open for any number of things that might be financially profitable, but might be environmentally or uh, socially very irresponsible and uh, degrading, like you'd mentioned. Um, Nathan or Brent, you have, uh, Nathan, specific life insurance is such a opaque and uh, I mean, I'm, I work in financial services, and when I navigated with, with Bluestone and chatting about life insurance. I could feel lost on occasion. And it's it's not one of those areas that's just easy to digest. I think there's a, a great way to say, how do life insurance companies and these things make money? And how, in what ways is that, you know, maybe not the most consumer or environmentally friendly? Yeah, well, uh, if you think banking is fossilized, you could probably find the insurance industry has you beat by a wide margin. Um, you know, to us, in one way, it's very, very simple. You pay a premium and the insurance company invests those premiums and they're supposed to have enough money to earn a profit and pay claims. Uh, but as George said, it's very interconnected and there are lots of things going on behind the scenes. And I think partly with the financial industry becoming so commoditized and impersonal in a lot of ways, it, it made that gap between you paying that premium or making that deposit and what was happening with your money, you know, they were completely separated. Um, and as, as you've mentioned, it, we're funding all sorts of things when we make a deposit or pay a premium. And we really came to the conclusion that there was a, the conviction that we came up with that, you know, you can only protect your family if you're also protecting your community and the planet. Like, even if you're not inclined to care about the greater good, you know, we think it's at a point people should realize you, you really can't 
take care of your family unless you're also taking care of the community uh, and the planet. So that's what drove our business model and uh, being a B Corp and a 1% of the planet member. Um, for us, it's, it's driving that personal connection that you know while you're a customer, you know your premiums are being invested in affordable housing and green energy transmission and other good projects. And then um, for us, we use the leverage of the product itself so that every customer gets a complimentary additional benefit. So when a claim is paid, you know your family is taken care of, but there's an additional complimentary benefit, uh, death benefit that you can choose any nonprofit you want uh, the money to go to. And that's how we get back to our conviction that you know every step along the way there's support not only to look out for your family but also the community and the planet and that can happen through community development financial institutions just one of the reasons we really like beneficial and you're also a cdfi um, so that's how we approach it and try to bring back the, the core purpose of it to look out for you know the greater uh, community and planet in addition to your family that's awesome. Brent, if you wanted to expound on anything in here as well. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. It's so great to hear these comments. Um, I think, I mean, to add to what Georgia said about our industry, yes, so much. I mean, the vast majority of people who call themselves financial advisors, which is not a regulated term, earn money from commissions and, you know, other sources besides the client even while holding themselves out as, as being the objective professional like your CPA, your attorney, your doctor, um, none of whom are generally paid by people other than you. Um, so I think you know, that's, that's a key piece of it. And the racial wealth gap part, I mean, I, I love working with higher net worth clients and, and with you know, progressive values and, and sharing ways that they can use their resources to uh, make the world better uh, in, in their definition of that. Um, and one of the interesting things that you know, kind of related to what Georgia was talking about is wealth redistribution. So we're seeing a real uptick in people who come in for financial planning, but not, not the usual kind, not the, uh, do I have enough? Can you make sure it grows until I die kind of exercise, but rather I want to give this away or impact invest it as well as possible. I want to have as much impact as I can. And here are my needs um, from it. So how do I kind of minimize my own like drag on the, on the wealth, on the resources in terms of consumption and my own security? Um, and maximize the amount of impact. And it's like, I look in most CFPs eyes when they get this kind of question, and you see like, it's like those old cartoons where the eyeballs spin. Um, it's like, does not compute, does not compute. You know, we've been trained to just sort of perpetuate and grow wealth. Um, and part of that, so even for folks not paid by commissions in our industry, the most common way of being paid is a percentage of assets under management. And so if you think about a typical fee of 1% of assets, what we all figure out pretty early in our careers is if I help someone with $500,000, 1% of that is 5,000 a year. And if I help someone with uh, $20 million, that's $200,000 a year, leaving aside for a minute that usually fees come down a little bit as the, as the size of the relationship grows. But what, what happens is that talented CFPs move up market. It's just like, well, let me try and add a zero or get double or get, you know, make a higher minimum. And that way my income will rise and my workload really won't uh, because 60 clients is 60 clients. Um, so what we did at Abacus 16 years ago is we did away with asset management, what are called AUM, assets under management minimums. Um, in an attempt to try and include many more people, uh, a lot more socioeconomic diversity. And that wasn't done for racial equity reasons back then, but um, in working on this paper I alluded to in my intro, I found that if you set a million dollar minimum at a firm like ours, you're excluding 98.2% of Black Americans and around 97% of Latinx Americans. So, you know, it's, I think we as financial planning firms and financial advisory firms have a moral obligation to provide, you know, whether it's the way George is doing it with, you know, racial wealth equity kinds of donations to, to NGOs, it sounds like, that are involved in that, or whether it's through 
you know, pro bono programs that we offer, um, or actually having paid services that are affordable um, that can set up those structures that uh, you know, allow people to really act on the key pieces of advice that will narrow the gap. These are all terrific examples. And I think it kind of leads into the next question I like asking of folks is there was a really amazing study that came out in 2015 that said among communities of color, trust in payday lenders was 65% higher than it was in banks. And for me, that as somebody who has studied the payday lending model and things, it's so extractive and so horribly expensive, then why is the trust higher in this? And the answer is pretty simple. You could beat yourself up and, and intellectualize it as much as you want. They are very transparent with what they charge. Um, by law, there's some regulatory pieces that make it, it's like a fast food menu. When you walk into a payday lender, it's on the wall of what it's going to charge you to do every last thing you're going to do there. And in that regard, trust in a lot of institutions, uh, especially among communities of color for banks, financial providers, uh, for life insurance, for other pieces, is that there is a lack of transparency. It's very opaque uh, in how these fees are calculated and how you pay uh, that drives a lot of lack of trust for communities of color, especially. Um, I, I'd like to just say with, with that kind of thought process in mind, how would you recommend to someone exempting your own company as an example for if you were to say to someone, I the right lenses for making a decision on picking a financial partner, regardless of what the background would be, if it's life insurance or if it's uh, financial products and services and investment or banking, or really just anywhere, what, what would you recommend in your industry specifically to look for uh, in finding a partner um, for fee structures or transparency or for uh, community service uh, involvement in their various communities. Uh, I'd love for you to just kind of share something that you would help think would help make a decision or folks could look for a shorthand for making a short list of the people to interview or think through making an intentional process if they are going to go through all the effort of divesting to ensure they end up investing in an organization that's more in line with their values. Um, and I feel like we got to Nathan last-ish last time in terms of the industry type. Nathan, if you'd like to go first, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, we probably represent the least transparent industry, so it's a, a good place to start. Um, I would say always having people keep top of mind that incentives matter, um, and along with that comes transparency, what you just said. So there's not many good choices in the insurance industry, but I think if you if you keep top of mind that incentives do matter and is your is your broker, uh, regardless of what they're calling themselves, as Brent said, uh, people are allowed to call themselves a financial advisor, uh, regardless of the number of conflicts of interest in their business model. But is it really clear how how the company and the person selling you the product is paid uh, is really important to know. Uh, I think ideally, um, is it clear that they're happy to collaborate uh, with your, ideally your fee only financial advisor? And that gets back to the transparency, like and the confidence that, you know, you're not trying to hide anything and that, hey, you have an accountant that you count on, you have a fee only financial planner that you rely on for advice to make sure it fits into your plan. You're only getting what you need and you understand exactly what you're purchasing. Um, we're a big fan of transparency often trumping disclosures. And there's been plenty of studies about the more disclosures grow, it can actually reach a point where it's counterproductive. Um, and in a very perverse way, maybe that gets to your payday lending scenario. Uh, and that's why we're such big fans of transparency, you understand what you purchase, you tend to get the right thing. Absolutely. Anyway, I just want to just hop in here uh, in general. I'd love to kind of hear what your thought processes are for making an informed decision. I'm happy to hop in. Sure. Um, well, first of all, we have a part of our website that's a referrals and resources page that because we get these questions so often and our minimum is a million dollars, so we can't work with everyone, clearly. One day, I'm gonna, we're going to be big and have been around for a long time, and that will, um, that will shift. Uh, but we have a ton of resources there, and we lay out exactly what we think a financial planner should be able to provide. Um, and I really love... Um, the comments, Nathan, on um, how people get paid and same rent. Um, and Manny, I think the understanding how folks are incentivized is so important. Um, and also, this is a high bar in this industry, but finding somebody who reflects who you are, um, because 
you know, CFPs, I think it's 2% or 3%, Brent, I don't know if you remember, are um, identify as black and 23% of CFPs are uh, female identified. So um, it's a little bit of a high bar, but they're out there. <laughs> they are out there and they're growing all the time. Um, so, and then I would also say there's some really interesting alternative models for paying financial planners now where there's retainer-based models, which are really great. Um, and I know planners that I love that charge as low as $100 a month to be a, a comprehensive financial planner um, as a support. And then of course there are uh, wealth managers and financial planning firms that offer pro bono services as well. I know we spend a fair amount of time doing that. So I think they should look like you, at least reflect your values and the way that they operate in the world. Um, and some of that's just a gut sense. Georgia, that made me think of it as when I, I do an, and occasionally enjoy a trip to Las Vegas outside of COVID and gambling for as entertainment. But you joke that those casinos are not built by the winners of the gambling or anything it's built by the house right and i think a lot of these conversations what you're reflecting of black or non-white investment planners are female identifying certified financial planners that if you fall over and find one it's not the industry standard and it's often not how the industry was built on the back of this kind of intentionality right that like the intentionality is something i think all of us reflected that you have to do a little bit of research right you have to find what your values are and what is important to you is kind of a general theme in here so that you could start asking questions of your financial partners to align with a lot of those same values, right? Um, Brent or Manny, did you wanna expound upon any of those sides from uh, decision lenses you think are important for making a decision in your in your specific product area? Sure. You know, we we get it. We, we might not be the best fit for everyone and that's totally okay. Um, we have our we, we cannot service everyone, whether it's for a yield purpose or a location purpose, um, so forth. But just do some, like Craig, you mentioned, do a little bit more due diligence, uh, look into community banks, into credit unions. If you're going more on the bigger scale, then do go through the government websites. Uh, community Reinvestment Act is a good, uh, it's a good place to start seeing what the rating for those banks are, whether it's outstanding, whether they, they need work on are reaching out more to the to the LMI community in terms of lending, affordable housing, all that good stuff. Um, just just do not go into that same motion of what branch is in the corner of my house, or or just simply go into what gives me the highest rate. Um, if you really care about certain pillars in your own self, uh, try to look into those. A simple Google search of of what banks are associated with this will probably give you a, a good start. But just do some research and um, and and further DD, and then you should be good. I would just add to that, Craig. Um, ask any financial advisor to disclose every kind of compensation they receive from all sources and make them put it in writing, um, because whether they're regulated by the SEC or by the state or by Finra, um, that's that's a pretty high bar. And you know, some of them will just hand you a big regulatory document like what's called the form ADV. And what I would say is, no, I don't want to go through this 60 page document. I want you to just tell me exactly what you're charging me, exactly what you're being paid if you recommend anything and everything, even if it's, you know, you're referring me over to this tax preparer or something. Do they take you golfing once a year? Like I want to know every way in which, you might have a conflict or be incentivized. Um, and you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll be able to tell really quickly, like the good folks will smile at that question. They will be relieved that you're asking that question because it really separates, you know, those who are operating, I think, in the client's best interest from those who, who have some conflicts. And, and I think there are good people in every kind of model. I want to be clear about that. Like, I don't mean to say anyone who's ever earned a commission is a bad advisor. I think there are some great advisors in that model and in that world, but I think the client deserves to know uh, exactly what the compensation is um, so that when the recommendation is coming, you can really process it with full information. That's terrific points all around. I, I really just encourage folks when you're thinking through this, this process as someone who spent the past few years going through and trying to divest from unintentional decisions. Um, Georgia has told me a story many times about money stories and thought processes around how we think about our money and how we guard our money and how we grow our money and what we want it to do is often not something that we're truly aware of until we address it. 
Um, and I think that's a big piece of when I opened my first bank account, the convenience was, oh, it's a Chase bank account because it's, I'm in San Diego and my parents are in Oregon and there's a Chase in both of those. So if they deposit money there, I could just walk in and get money. And of course it wasn't that simple because it was actually a Washington Mutual that was owned by a Chase and it turned into this whole bananas outcome that was really difficult. But at the same time, I stuck with Chase and I kept with them and I kept things going afterward. And it was not really until I took an intentional lens of this and started thinking about working in finance that I realized just how deep the well goes of, you know, when you're not paying attention of what your money can be doing. Uh, and so once you start really taking that lens to a lot of your life, start asking yourself where you spend your money, right? These are questions that the B Impact Assessment helps you think about of your alignment, not just as a business, but take it back to you personally of like, do the people I do business with and make money off of my business look like me, respect the same things that I respect, appreciate my values for what they are as a value add rather than a hindrance to what they're trying to do. Uh, and you could start really seeing a lot of outcomes reflect that. Um, I, I like the expression, a lot of you get where you're going. And if you target a specific thing as the one thing you want the most, and if that's the highest return, you might find the highest return, but it's not it's the same way capitalism has looked at a lot of these conversations around returns is they're going to ignore the other bottom lines of people and planet. And that's not what we're about as B Corps, right? If you start preferencing things of where you want to go and head that direction, you tend to get where you're going. Um, so that's as moderator on this to not editorialize too much to say there's a lot of really wonderful opportunities to assess what you currently do and what you value and take the time to make an informed decision. Um, a lot of that reduces the error carried forward element um, of that you just, the fact that if you've been with the same person for 20 years, ask yourself if they're still the right fit for you and the due diligence you put into that. Like Manny said, there's a lot of and due, due, due diligence to put in. And if it turns out you were already in the right place, then you could feel reinforced that you made the right decision. And if it opens up the opportunity to have some discussions, there's a lot of really great resources out there that I know we'd share through this, our slides and things after this is over, uh, after this event is over. But just in general, know that this is an opportunity not to make your life more difficult, but to make your life more meaningful and to make things more aligned with what you care about. Um, and it could seem as far flung as something as life insurance, right? To say that like there are real ways that your life insurance partner could align with your values rather than prey upon them uh, in ways that you're not aware of. Um, so with that, I, I'd love if anyone else on the panel has anything else they'd like to share or next step resources type things, things that they found really valuable uh, in their processes of alignment personally or professionally. And we could just open it up to questions for the rest of the community. And if not, it's it's all good. It's more just a question of if there's something that you really value in the, as making some of these conversations uh, about uh, about how to make things more intentional in your life and your practice. I think we all know the B Impact Assessment has asked that question of our businesses. And if you haven't been part of the B Impact Assessment, um, if it's worth that to put in for your business, I think taking a lens to your personal life and going through that sometime and setting aside the chance to do that would be great. Georgia, and your hands up. Um, yeah, I'm the thing I keep thinking about right now, and it's probably because we're in the middle of a really difficult tax year, um, is tax policy and tax money stories that are driving. It's just amazing to hear how unconscious people who consider themselves very um, concerned about global impact, how pervasive the story of I need to pay less taxes, or especially as business owners, tax policy is it's wild how low some of our clients' tax rates are because they own a business. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about with folks is um, setting an internal um, minimum effective tax rate and giving away until you get up to that point. Um, because sometimes you can ask your CPA to not take it, but sometimes that just gets complicated. I know that these can be circular calculations, but I do think there's some space to, to push against that dominant narrative. Um, one example is when uh, the previous administration, which I only refer to him as Voldemort, um, when the 2018 tax bill went through, the dominant narrative in the media was that all of our clients were gonna pay more in taxes or that everyone was gonna pay more in taxes. There was, all, there was just so much fear in the uh, financial noise. And I made every single CPA in our tax planning meetings that year tell our clients exactly how much they were going to save or pay extra. Every client saved money, 
But what it also did is it put a number on it because effective tax rates are really soft and, and squishy. They don't really make sense to us. We don't really understand how taxes get paid and how the bottom line works out. And so I had a client who saved $8,000 um, and she had the internalized internal permission by knowing that number to give it to a friend of hers whose child needed hearing aids. She didn't feel like she needed to give it away to get more of a deduction. It created the sense of like, this isn't my money. I don't want this money. This is not an administration I want to be connected with. And so therefore let's give it a structure and then put it somewhere where it could potentially do some more good. It's awesome. And I think it's it's also bears witness to the a statistic I share a lot, which is the philanthropy industry in this country is about $180 billion per year GDP. Basically, if it were a country, it'd be $180 billion. Uh, but our overall GDP as a country in the United States is $21 trillion. So if you think about what that is as for nonprofit wage, basically, it's but less than 1% of our overall resources go to nonprofits and solving these problems. And there's very few things in this world that can take 1% of the resources and have an equivalent outcome to counterbalance a lot of the negative impacts that come from the other 99%. It's very difficult to do that in a lot of contexts. Um, so it's incumbent upon us to pick business partners and our resources, both personally and professionally, to align them with our values. Uh, and uh, in that regard, kind of drive that, give less work for the nonprofit community to have to do in general, um, that we can kind of do that and clean up the capitalism side of things a bit. So there's less work for nonprofits to have to clean up. And Rose, you'd mentioned there are some questions on our list and things I'd love to open it up and see if we can get some of those answered. Yeah, some of them were in the chat, but I started making a list in order. And so um some of them were sent to me directly so sure. is the reality that we are having to continue to operate within a broken inequitable system making some progress or are there new systems that are outside the broken systems reality i can paste that in the chat it was yeah any of the panelists want to grab that one in particular i'm happy to chime in craig i guess I always feel that it, it gets back to your last question too, that um, I think it's gonna be a really big challenge, as Georgia said, while tax policy is the way that it is and while externalities are not priced in, it's it's just too big of a door for companies to, to operate in when they don't have to pay for the damage. Uh, but there are an increasing number of positive ways. And going back to your, your last question, I found one of the most helpful resources for people to get their hands on what's actually going on in their community is through the community development financial institutions. They tend to do a lot of the really you know, hard work. And again, beneficial is a CDFI yourself, which is one of the reasons uh, we love your work. But like if you go to the Opportunity Finance Network, which is one of the parent organizations, you can go to their locator and like, there are four CDFIs operating you know, in Portland. And you can dig right in and see exactly what kind of projects and it's remarkable how a reasonable amount of money i, I love the uh, example of like the eight thousand dollars or quantifying what was saved from a system that you know doesn't make sense and when people realize if if money goes into those nonprofit cdfi loan funds it's often 10 times what you give to them ends up out in the community in a project because it lets them bring in other capital and expand their scope of operations. And they also, along with that capital, tend to provide really valuable services uh, around planning, QuickBooks support for privately held businesses. Uh, so I think that's where people get to see the work on the ground uh, from the part of the economy that normally is not funded, um, either at all or at predatory rates. So I think that's a, a great resource to bring yourself closer to what's happening in your state and in your community. Yeah, I'll add a little, I'll chime in a little bit of a, a few other resources. Um, one of course is uh, bcorporation.net. Um, if you, as you may know, B corporations are, are assessed based on how well they're doing with their employees, the environment, um, their impact metrics. Um, so I, I tend to use bcorporation.net many times uh, to just see what vendors or what companies are around me and see if I, if I need something rather than going to uh, a big produce, a big produce market, uh, 
a big corporation one, I just go to the, the nearest certified B Corp one if I can make the drive. Um, so bcorporation.net is a good, it's a good website just to see what ethical companies are around your area. Um, ethical meaning by the B, uh, certified B Corp standards. Um, the other one is Mighty Deposits. Um, uh, Mighty Deposits is a good website that just basically shows what um, what banks are good with and what they're doing with your money. Um, so that's another that's another good resource website where you can just go and, and see um, what what's out there other than the heavily renowned names that you hear in, on the media all the time. And are we ready for another question? Sure, let's do it. Okay, um, this one was sent to me. Um, as a BIPOC woman, it feels like there is a legacy perception that only wealthy people need financial planners. What is being done to break out of the high net worth only paradigm that perpetuates this narrative? I'd love to take this one if I can. Um, I think, I mean, a few things are being done. It's 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 getting a lot of attention within the CFP profession itself. Um, the the sort of nonprofit uh, arm of the CFP board, which is the accreditation body, um, is called the Center for Financial Planning, and that they have a number of things going on. They have a named scholarship program for BIPOC uh, aspiring CFPs. Um, there's another industry association that created a Black and Latinx internship program for aspiring CFPs, and a number of firms are participating in that. And uh, so we're going to have, I believe it's six uh, Black and Latinx interns this summer for about 10 weeks, um, you know, learning what it's like to work inside business. And I, the reason I mentioned, sorry, I went with race rather than socioeconomic, which is kind of where you started, um, but just there's so much overlap between those two. Um, but I think, you know, the companies like LearnVest and NerdWallet and LVest have tried to address this issue um, in a number of ways. And then there is, there's a group called XY Planning Network that is a, an association of a whole bunch. If someone's pasting things in the chat, I think it's xypn.org, I think it might be .com, but um, Anyway, it's hundreds of planners around the country that uh, will generally work on a fixed fee basis. Uh, some will allow you to just, you know, come in for an hour or two and pay a, a fixed project fee. Some will take you on on a retainer, uh, you know, that might be, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 a month. Um, and so that's the way in which many firms are, you know, kind of reaching folks who aren't high net worth yet. Um, and then what we're trying to build out at Abacus, like, you know, the more we look at these figures that even ignoring race, I mean, roughly 85% of Americans just cannot get fee only independent financial advice unless it's pro bono or subsidized in some way. And yet the technology, you know, I think part of what's missing is that tech only solutions don't reach people in a, in a trusted enough place and a personalized enough place. Um, so tech enabled, um, but human-centered advice, I think, is where the answer is going to be. Um, and so what we're building out at Abacus, and I'm sure many other our firms are doing it, um, is kind of the spectrum of, uh, we, we have, for example, a young professionals course that is for people in their 20s and 30s that are trying to just start saving and building wealth and having good habits. And it's six sessions over the course of six weeks that, you know, it costs, I think, 100 bucks or something like that. So... And, and the groups are not that big. So there's so many different delivery methods, um, online courses, DIY, you know, tools like George's on our website, referrals and resources to use to, to go find advice. And I think, you know, that is such a huge and needy market, if you will, not, you know, in terms of the amount of impact we can have as social enterprises, as B Corps, that it's got, you know, some of us, it, it's got our full attention. I'd like to add, um, Ren, I'm so excited that y'all are working on that because it's just, it's really such a huge opportunity to create a market that the financial industry has basically decided that they don't believe exists. In the same way that um, they've had, uh, I remember 10 years ago when I first started in the industry, um, 
there were marketing campaigns for women to help women manage their money as if women had never had money before to manage, as if we were a minority when we're 51% of the population. So there's a um, there's a there's a, a huge opportunity to innovate in the industry to produce solutions. Um, but I also think, again, I'm kind of a policy geek, but we have this problem of so many unserved people because of systemic policy, policy creating issues. So what if we were arguing as an industry for um, another level of social security so people could actually get guaranteed income in retirement because 401 ks are really problematic that we put the onus of responsibility on people who don't know how to invest, who shouldn't really know because they have other expertise. Um, and it, it just creates layers of fees for individual people. So what if we were creating more um, uh, population wide solutions? I mean, as we push more and more people into independent contractors, fewer and fewer people have access to life insurance through their, their employer. So what if there was an Oregon based life insurance and disability insurance um, fund? So I think I want the industry to produce these, but I also want us all as into citizens to require that we provide social solutions to problems that I don't actually want capitalism to solve. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, one that struck me when I first heard it about that level of if you invest your money at 10% roughly right in seven years, that money will double um, just off of the, the compounding interest piece. And they try to teach you some of these things in high school through E and through other levels of uh, you know, logarithmic and exponential increases that just don't really stick in a way that, uh, you know, that if you have somebody who starts saving at 25 versus saving at 32, Right, the difference the difference of those seven years is an entire compounding interest you've lost out on all that money between 25 and 32 could end up with basically twice as much in your retirement account just for saving even smaller amounts seven years earlier, um, which driving racial wealth gap pieces and things that we're discussing as well. Those are elements of if you don't have parents who are already invested in the stock market or could think about investing in a 401k, you're not getting that advice from one of the only people that in your life who could give it to you. Um, only 5% of Americans respond uh, like accurately to a question of how much money do you make per year? It's a very guarded thing that we have in our society of talking about money as well. Um, and I think that that can often drive the, the fear of wanting to talk about it or that your status in this capitalist society is lessened because you don't make as much as someone else you know. Therefore, your money isn't worth their time or those investments could be something the industry has driven widely as well. Um, and that's where I've seen a lot of those, those questions when I have people ask me of like, well, what drives these outcomes? It's like, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons for these going that way. But I also hope that there's, as you said, the innovation to other folks recognizing that these are not accidents that this has happened, um, that this is the way that the industry has been driven and it's been profitable to operate that way in finance, in banking, in life insurance. There's areas that it's been that way and we have to demonstrate that the need is there, right? Um, and Rose, I don't know how much time we had in particular if we're scheduled beyond one for well, time. We're scheduled till 1.15. Okay. Um, so I do have another question. It was in the chat from Mike. Um, ESG and SRI funds have grown tremendously over the last couple of years. How can I tell if the fund is really having positive impact or just labeled to appear ESG or SRI? I'm happy to take that. I'm sure some of my fellow columnists could jump in too. Um, columnist, palinals. I guess I, I figured we worked at a newspaper there for a second. Um, so uh, the interesting thing in, in public markets, so whoever asked the question mentioned funds, which I think you know, mostly means public stocks, public bonds. Um, for the most part, uh, ESG and SRI uh, strategies uh, start with and many end with what we call negative screening. So that is, I don't want to own fossil fuel companies. I don't want to own gun manufacturers. Uh, this all started with, uh, well, you could say it started with the Quakers in the late 1800s, but more recently it started uh, with the South African divestment movement of the mid 80s and 90s where CalPERS and other big institutions divested Coke for still selling products in South Africa. Um, and that was very effective because it was combined with government sanctions and basically brought down the apartheid government. Um, 
for the most part, divestment doesn't change the cost of capital to a company. Um, it, it, and it doesn't materially change it, even on the bond side of the equation. Bonds are less efficient. So there's a bit more of an argument to be made that you know a bad corporation will have to pay a slightly higher interest rate if enough investors boycott its bonds. Um, but I don't think that's really what we in this movement are after. What we're after is big corporate behavior change and municipal behavior change. And looking at, you know, for example, I was on the call, a call two days ago with a municipal bond manager who, who calls up city treasurers and state treasurers and says, hey, do you realize that your budget looks a lot like Kenosha and a lot like Ferguson? And basically you've got the same percentage of black population and you're collecting X percent of your revenues from penalties and fines and bail. Um, and this isn't good. Like this is a major kind of fiscal risk that bondholders are now starting to look at. Um, so that it, we call engagement. And I'd say the, the biggest question for you to ask of any financial advisor or you know ESG, SRI fund that, that holds itself out that way is what are you doing around engagement with corporations, with municipalities, you know, with whatever you're investing my money in, because th that's where the action is. And it's time consuming, it's expensive, um, and it's often hard to track uh, what, what your additionality has been, like what you as an investor or as a fund manager have contributed to a particular issue. Um, but in public markets, which are, you know, the vast, vast majority of all investment capital and for almost everybody, it, it's 100% of what you're invested in outside of cash in banks. Um, I, I think that's, that's the entirety of the kind of measurable positive impact you can have. Um, we all feel better not owning a gun manufacturer and we probably feel better if we're putting more of our money into renewable energy companies, but again, that because almost all these securities are traded on secondary markets, we're not really changing the cost of capital of the company. We're not generally giving a company more money that they otherwise wouldn't have had to do R&D or to market their great product. Um, we're just driving up the price essentially, um, which is a nice signal to the world that ESG matters, but you know, not as important as engagement. There are no publicly traded B Corps either, right? So that's always one of the bummers when you think about like, well, I'll just divest my stock portfolio and invest in B Corps or something directly. And it's like, you don't even have one to choose from in that way anymore. So um, I think that that's one of those troubling things for, you know, as me as an investor, it's like, oh man, like I can't invest in that, but it's more like Manny used the term harm reduction, right? Manny have let say of like, or if you do no harm of trying your best to find organizations that do a better job than others, if you're going to be in the market. Right. And that they're those ESG funds and things. That's the hope is that, those, you know, it, we have to trust our advisors. And find, that's where another one of those elements of picking an important and picking who you're investing with and who's going to give you advice is that you're going to trust that they're able to have the expertise in those areas that you you just simply don't have the time, money or, you know, like to be able to go and, and figure out yourself. And if anyone has any further questions, then feel free to put them in the chat or ask out loud. I think I got all of them that were sent to me, but just want to give that opportunity. I saw somebody had a question about 401ks in there. Um, and we don't, I mean, we do very few of them just for a, a few clients who need them. Um, but I would love to hear anything from the community, if you know of any, um, Entry, like small business 401k providers um, that do um, a reasonable job, even just lower cost would be very um, welcome. I know there's things like um, guideline and betterment, but I have a little bit of a worry around the um, venture capital funds that I think own those um, businesses and what their intentions are in the long run. So I'd love to hear from the community if anybody has any resources. And an opportunity for innovation shows itself. 
Um, I will say that this is one of the many reasons I'm proud to be an Oregonian. We are one of the early states to offer a statewide retirement plan through the Oregon Saves program. And it's not perfect, um, but it's, I think, a um, signal that we're trying to make sure at least people have access to a retirement plan at the state-based level. Um, so. Awesome. And Brent, you were, we talked about the Cal Savers program too, that there are other states that are going to start requiring based on the number of employees a corporation has that starts at 50, right? And then goes down to five in a year or two that like it really starts winnowing down quickly of the size of company that has to offer uh, an investment plan. Yeah, it does. I, I'm hoping that, I mean, I know the CIO, of, uh, sorry for the jargon, the chief investment officer of CalSTRS, um, and I know she's a passionate ESG impact investment person. So I'm hoping the Cal Savers will, will hopefully default to ESG offer, uh, you know, offerings um, like some of our bigger competitors are starting to. Certainly millennials and Gen Zs strongly, strongly prefer that um, now that you know, the early adopters in the space have proven you don't sacrifice returns to, to have impact to do these things. Um, I will say, Georgia, to your question, like we have done some 401ks for some of our clients who have small private businesses. So we are aware of the space. Um, we do do it. Um, there, you know, there's some others out there, Social K and, and others that do it. Um, but it, it, one thing I'll mention, just because I know there's a number of business owners in the session, is if you can make your 401k um, opt, opt out rather than opt in. In other words, everybody's enrolled. And everybody, let's say, has what if you match, if your employer matches a certain amount of salary in the 401k, perhaps make that the default amount that is withheld from employees' payroll. And they can increase that or they can opt out of it if they really, really need the cash flow for consumption. Um, but the participation rates go through the roof when you have an opt out rather than an opt in. Great. Well, Rose, if we don't have the further discussions on these other pieces, um, if it's just, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I know it's a heady conversation um, for a lot of these pieces, but hopefully if you take nothing else away from this today, a lot of what I feel I take of this is just finding the resources are out there, right? Little X-Files, like you kind of feel like it's out there. You got to just find them. And I think that that's the level of conversation of having with other folks who are you trust and share similar values with of discovering your path towards what matters to you and what do you value and then putting your money showing you know kind of where your money where your mouth is a bit more and putting making sure that your investments and your banking and your uh if you're searching for life insurance I mean you could do a whole lot worse than aligning along the folks who are on this call um, but we're not the only options and other pieces that are out there right but I think it's about finding the signal and the noise and finding partners who align with your values so that you can get a short list going of finding, comparing, contrasting the people and the services that offer you the closest to what you're looking for. Um, and I just really appreciate the time of everybody who gave freely today and shared their, their visions and pieces and look forward to similar conversations in the future. Um, I know all of our contact information is going to be shared by Rose and the, the, the follow-up email. Uh, this will be recorded if you want to share it with someone in your family or someone else that you're uh, company or anybody else who'd like to have a conversation. Um, I know everybody on here would be happy to follow up and have further conversations if it was fruitful for your family or your business uh, to have a further discussion. Um, so just thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your week and happy spring.